How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness Your loving kindness Tore through the shadows of my soul The work is finished The end is written Jesus Christ, my living hope Who could imagine so great a mercy What heart could fathom such boundless grace The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame The cross has spoken, I am forgiven The King of kings calls me his own Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever My living home Hallelujah Praise the one who set me free Hallelujah Death has lost its grip on me You have broken every chain There's salvation
the highest king would welcome me I was lost but he brought me and know oh, his love for me oh his love Well, hello, Impact. We are in our final series, our final weekend in the series that we called Church Poisoning. I'm stoked to share this message with you, but before I do a couple quick things. Number one, hopefully, we haven't been mentioning it every week, but a regular rhythm in our services, both in person and virtually, is the act of communion together. I hope that whether it be if you're listening to this on your jog on Spotify or on Google Podcasts or on Apple Podcasts or maybe you're watching it on your TV at home, I hope at some point in the week, if not while you're listening, you take the moment to take the cup and to take the, the, the bread or the cracker or the chip or whatever it is and take the moment to quiet our hearts and to say, thank you, Jesus, for what you have done to provide this salvation through Jesus Christ, that the, that the healing from our sins was because of what Christ did. And that's what communion is all about. I hope you're taking the time and your week to do that, even if you're continuing to watch virtually. Thank you again for your generosity. That the giving your financial gifts each weekend is what allows us to do the work of the church. We don't have a, a, any, a good that we're selling. There's not a commodity that we offer. We just offer community and hopefully point you to Jesus. And your generosity to, uh, the, the, to impact allows us to do that in, in radical and bigger and broader ways. So thank you for your generosity. You can give online at impact.cc. You can mail it in or you can swing by the church office. Hopefully... We'll see you in person when you feel more comfortable. So speaking of virtual versus in person, I wanted to try something different. Well, number one, it's going to kind of help give us a gauge on who's still watching virtually, how many. We still have numbers for virtual views are still kind of where they were and have been for a long time. So we know many of you are watching and or listening virtually. So if that's you, 
What I want to do is ask you, if you're watching this on your TV, just snap a picture of your TV. Maybe your dog's in the picture. Maybe your husband wants to make some kind of goofy face. I don't know. And then post that on Instagram or Facebook. Tag us in it, Life with Impact. Tag us in it. And then hashtag Impact at Home. So you can even, if you don't tag us in it, maybe you can't find us, just post it and hashtag impact at home. And that will give you the opportunity to be entered into uh, a drawing that one person that does that will win a $50 gift card to Amazon just to say thank you for staying connected. And it helps us kind of know who is still watching virtually. And also maybe you're listening on Spotify or Apple or whatever. You can screenshot your phone. You can do that too. You can just screenshot your phone, post it as an Instagram story, post it as a Facebook story, post it on Instagram or Facebook on your newsfeed, hashtag impact at home, tag us in it if you can. And somebody, whether you're watching it on YouTube, on your TV or listening on Spotify or on some other podcast streaming platform, just let us know you're listening. Post it, hashtag impact at home, and one of you guys will win a fifty dollar gift card just to say thanks for staying connected. So let's get into it. Let me here get my computer back on here. It went off on me because I've been so wordy. Hang on a second. Uh, there, cool. So week six, week six of our series called Church Poisoning. I have loved this series. I hope you have. Like. One of the things that we've been doing each weekend is inviting you to send us your stories. So your stories, my story at impact.cc. We have gotten a bunch of those in. And the reason we opened up my story at impact.cc is because there are lots of us who have been affected, good, bad, and ugly, by the ministry of the church. And we want to know what your story is. How have you been impacted, good, bad, and ugly, by the church because this series has been about us deciding that it's worth taking responsibility for some of the hard things that the church has done. See, here's the thing. I said in week one, this is not about picking a fight with the church. We love the church. I love the church. And just like I mentioned in week one, if you pick a fight with my bride, it's going to get ugly. If we pick a fight with the bride of Jesus, the church, it's going to get ugly. This is not about us picking a fight with the church. It's actually, believe it or not, about uniting ourselves with the church. It's so easy. And so many churches are started out of this idea that that's what they do, so now I'm going to do this. I don't want to be like them, so now I'm going to do this. It's us and them. But friends, it's not about if that church hurts you. It's about us saying, as the church, I'm sorry that we hurt you. And so since we are all brothers and sisters adopted into the one family of God, this series has been about us saying, whether it was 8299 East Stockton Boulevard, Impact Community Church that hurt you, or it was 30 years ago, 5 years ago, 10 years ago, in another church, we want to be gracious enough, humble enough to say that we are sorry for how the ministry of the church has hurt you. How have we, like food poisoning has made you sick, if we as a church have made you sick, how can we prevent that from ever happening again? So week six, all right? So last week I was flying home. You might have heard that my wife and I celebrated 20 years of marriage. And so we were coming home, flying on a Southwest flight um, to get back into Sacramento. And I was watching a movie. I was, I was scouring through what, what in-flight movies that Southwest had to offer. And I chose a movie I'd never seen before. I'm somewhat of a movie buff. I love watching movies. I'm the weirdo that has no problem going to the movie theaters and sitting by myself and watching a movie. In fact, I pay a monthly fee to Regal and Cinemark so that I can, I know, I, I, I keep saying they're free movies. They're not free movies, but I get to, I pay a monthly fee and have unlimited movies so I can pop in and watch a movie whenever I want. It's like my quiet place, my unplugged place, so I love movies. And so one of the movies that I watched well, the only movie I watched actually on the way home back to Sacramento after my wife and I were out of town together was a movie called 12 Strong. And I'm not, this isn't a commercial for 12 Strong, but I will tell you something incredible that I, I saw in the movie 12 Strong that reminded me what, an, what, what a gift our armed forces are, what an incredible work of art technology is, right? So the movie... It's a true story, so uh, there's no spoilers here because history has already kind of given you the spoilers. This is just history, right? So I'll try not to give you the in in entire plot of the movie, but the movie is set right after 9-11 hit our soil. The first group of special forces to leave here to go to Afghanistan. That, that's what this movie is all about. It's the 12 men that left America to go to Afghanistan to begin to uh, make right that, that was done to us on our soil with 9-11. And so what happens is they actually connect with an, an Afghan warlord 
who also hates the Taliban. And together, the Afghan warlord, who's kind of a boots on the ground, gnarly kind of, uh, kind of just does everything the, the down and dirty way. And then you got the armed forces of America, who's doing everything the the uh, I was gonna say the right way, but the the the, the polished way, the uh, the political way, the you know the the way that the the, the politically correct way, right? And so it's this tension of trying to have the United States Armed Forces somehow partner with this Afghan warlord because we both have this, this, this a score to settle with the Taliban. So what happens is the Afghan warlord takes a, the a U.S. troops on horseback to where the Taliban are and U.S. troops call in via satellite sat phone to, I, sat, I felt so cool when I said sat phone. Uh, so they, via satellite phone to a, air, a plane that's up ahead, here's the coordinates where the Taliban are. And once they called that in, this movie highlights that boom, spot after spot after spot with these coordinates that are given, bombs are dropped to take out the Taliban. Incredible movie. I do encourage you watching it. It's an amazing story. I mean, I'm, I'm a crier. I cried several times just out of sheer patriotism of how incredible that these these men and women were. But I'm not here to necessarily talk about 9/11 or the war that ensued after that. But I noticed as I watched the 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 the, the satellite phone, the sat phone, uh, as the the coordinates would come through the sat phone to this plane that was in the sky, and these bombs dropped, and devastation came upon you because of one phone call that wreaked havoc on the Taliban, and I marveled at the, how, the modern warfare technology. Well, this weekend, I'm talking to you about actually something that's even more dangerous and detrimental than what we have access to to call bombs from the sky to blow up cities and villages and countries. In fact, I'll just read you kind of what I wrote down. Imagine, put your thinking caps on. Imagine a weapon so powerful that it makes the atom bomb look like a toy, right? So this weapon has the potential to literally bring anguish into the life of every human being on the planet, but without necessarily destroying them physically. I feel like I'm giving you a riddle. I'm not. This is true. I'm, uh, this is I me mean, for real here. This weapon could, however, produce scars and wounds that will last a lifetime, scars that may never heal properly. This weapon is available to the poorest of the poor as well as the richest of rich. In fact, nations, every nation, third world country, the, the, the richest of countries has access to this weapon. And in addition to that, every individual has access to this weapon. There are few laws against the possession of this weapon. And the weapon that now exists or will ever exist will have the deadly potential of this ancient weapon. It is as old as man himself. I don't know if maybe you're already imagining what that weapon might be. Maybe you already know exactly what I want to talk about today. But here is the weapon that I'm talking about. Okay, maybe not that particular, maybe not those particular tongues in fact, the, the one on the bottom right, I think it is, is actually my new puppy. I, I built this entire message trying to just show off my puppy. I'm just kidding. But though, today I want to talk to you about the tongue. Those are cute and adorable tongues, right? But you and I, we have this thing in our mouth that we use to communicate that the Bible tells us is a dangerous, dangerous weapon. More dangerous than the most dangerous weapon of warfare that we have available to us. So I'm not just talking about the way we use our tongue, but I am including the way we use our tongue. I wanna to scroll through some pictures really quickly. So, so Joe, put this first picture up. Maybe this is one way that you have seen the tongue used. Maybe it's one way that you've used the tongue that has wreaked havoc on your family. Maybe you resonate with the little girl who's sitting there being berated by her dad. Maybe you imagine as a parent, you know that at times you have used your tongue to wreak havoc on your family. I, I, you know, I, I, I say regularly, I, I see a therapist often and in the, in the instant, one of the first things that you'll do in therapy is begin to talk about your childhood because it's the wounds of our childhood way more so than the winds of our childhood that produces the character and the wounds that we have today. The next picture, maybe you resonate with that, is the spouse yelling at each other. Our tongue goes to battle, goes to war in our homes with our spouses. That next picture, it's like this idea of this nagging wife. It can go the other way around with a nagging, overbearing husband. 
It's just this, you're never good enough. Why didn't you? I thought you were going to. And then uh, one of you is, is leaning over the other person, just nagging in this sense of you're never going to be enough. And then the other person is, maybe you resonate with the person sitting there taking it like, will you just leave me alone? Will you just say something kind about me? Will you just speak life into me instead of constantly telling me where I don't measure up? This next picture, the fourth picture, yeah, I, I just thought it was a hilarious picture, but... It's that moment when we're at our wit's end, when we say things because we're at our max, right? We just, we're our bandwidth, the end of our rope, the end of our fuse, and we just explode and our, our tongue says things that hurts people because we are maxed out. And this one here, maybe you resonate with this one. Right, this one hurts. Right, we've all been, we've all done it. And we've all been, been victims of it. It's gossip. It's when you know something's been said about you and you can't fix it because you heard it from a friend of a friend of a friend. Or maybe you're the person, you'd know it. When you saw that picture, something just stirred like, oh crap, this message is going to hurt because you are a gossiper and you know it. You try not to be, but that bend towards, you get a glass of wine in you and you just open up like the dam just burst and you tell everybody's dirty laundry. As you just tell it how it is. Well, the tongue is a dangerous weapon and you are wreaking havoc on the lives of others. Or maybe you're on the end of whose who havoc has been wreaked on you. This, this next one, this is interesting, right? Today, when, when this was written, when James wrote a passage that I'm going to read to you, where right, we talk about the tongue, like James probably didn't know that eventually we would be talking with more than just our mouth. And so maybe you, like this lady here sitting on the steps, have sent text messages just like berating people, speaking your mind, saying what needed to be said. And so while you didn't use this tongue, you sure had a lot to say. And that, my friends, is just as dangerous and as deadly, perhaps even more so, because you can go back and read it again and again and again. And next one, I, I've read some of you dudes, some of your Facebook posts, and I'm convinced this is what you look like on the other end of that phone or that computer, as you're just saying what you got to say. Using your tongue, using your mouth is more than just what you say. Some of, you, some of us hide behind a keyboard angrily ranting on a soapbox about the other political party or the other legislation or the other people group or the other friend that bailed on you. And we just stand on the other side of that phone and the other side of that keyboard speaking our mind. And instead, we're not using this tongue. But we sure have a lot to say that's inflicting some brutal wounds. This, maybe this is you. I... The, the, the email, email's another one. You know, you got that coworker that is driving you crazy. And, and so you might not walk in there and speak your mind, but some of us get extra strong. You know, like a keyboard, a keyboard is like the, the, the steroids of communication. You can say whatever you want to say behind a keyboard. So maybe it's that, maybe you find a way, you're the, saying what you need to say, speaking your mind, just brutally being just relentless in how you feel towards that coworker when you're behind the keyboard sending that email. And lastly, I, before you read too closely, don't worry, this isn't a snapshot of any of your guys' Facebook because that would be pretty brutal <laughs> because I know some of your Facebooks, some of y'all panic, some of y'all like, oh crap, he saw my Facebook. No, this isn't any of your Facebook, but man, what we say to each other in a comment section. Oh my gosh, watching the church just berate each other in the comment sections of posts is brutal, I know. I know you guys have experienced that. The tongue is a weapon of mass destruction. Today's message is for impact. If you are not a part of impact and you're listening in, welcome, thank you, don't go anywhere, stick around because you will hear the heart of our church. But the message today is for impact. Those of you that are anchored into who we are because what you are doing and what you are saying makes a difference. If we believe that the church is not about the building but it's about you and I being the hands and feet of Jesus, then what you are saying with this or with this or with this is representing the church that we are trying to show the world Jesus through. I want to look at a few things. So this, this weekend, we've been doing you know, we've been doing the FDA violations and how we can see those parallels. So the FDA walks into a restaurant and says, if you continue to do this, it's going to it could potentially hurt people, food poisoning. And the FDA, we looked at we looked at four violations that the FDA gives to restaurants when they're not up to code on the way they're serving food, and we've drawn parallels to how what, what can we as a church learn about what the FDA has said, so that when we serve the person of Jesus, the people, remember our, our anchor verses in Psalms: "Taste and see that the Lord is good." 
And if the Lord is going to be good when people taste him, we got to make sure that what we're doing is in, da- in danger of poisoning them when they eat what it is. They eat what it is that we're giving them. So this weekend's final violation is cross-contamination. The FDA violation of cross-contamination. Cross-contamination can be quickly defined as like when, when bacteria or what's on one food or one utensil or one storage container it gets transferred to another one, and what that, what that happens is it can create sickness and airborne diseases and all that kind of stuff, and then when you give it to somebody, you serve it to somebody, they might even know, they can't see those things, but they've been cross-contaminated because of how the food was handled or stored, and now that cross-contamination could potentially have fatal, I mean, if you have an allergy to shellfish or an allergy to peanuts and there's contamination from one thing to the other, that could be potentially life and death, fatal mistake. I do believe Listen to me, church. Listen. I do believe that we can do some fatally damaging things in the way that we cross-contaminate. Maybe not physically. But I think we carry the opportunity and the weightiness of being able to do some spiritually fatal things. I, I want to go through these quickly. Maybe maybe you've been to a restaurant when there's a guy at a urinal next to you or a lady's or you could come to the, the chef and the you know it's the chef because they're in that all white. Maybe they're even wearing the hat, but come out of the stall, they, or they come out, leave the urinal, they look in there, they fix their hat, fix their deal, and they walk out. Like, if you're like me, look, you're out. Like, I'm not I'm not about to go eat some food where the chef just was in the bathroom and he then goes and makes my food. What, I don't want what you were doing in the bathroom on my food. I think we can all agree with that. This idea of being clean, that what we do here doesn't get contaminated to what we're trying to do here. This is a gross story. I'm sorry. It's a Blink, flipping real life story. So my very first job when I was 15 years old, I worked at Marion's Pizza. Okay, I made pizzas for this, this small little Dayton, Ohio pizza chain. Promise you, this is no joke. So we actually had this grinder. We'd stick this sausage in there and we'd grind up the sausage and it would come out. And so the grinder, the end of the grinder was like real close to the ground. So you'd put it in and you'd put like a cardboard box on the ground to, on the ground to collect the, the ground up sausage that would go on top of the pizzas. On more times than I can count, I will watch people after they ground the sausage, half of it would have missed the, 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 the cardboard box and it would be on the floor. Other, other times you'd go to pick up the cardboard box and it would be just flimsy and hit the ground and you scoop it up. I promise you, it stopped me from ever, or I will never, ever, ever, ever order sausage on my pizza ever again because that scarred me for life. We want to trust that what people did when they made our food wasn't contaminated by things that aren't supposed to be in our food. What about me and you? How, what can we learn as the church? Well, let's read a quick verse of scripture. In James chapter 3, I'm going to read 7 through 12. People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless and evil. It is restless and evil, full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. And so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same And so yeah, and so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. James says, Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. Does a spring of water bubble out with both fresh water and bitter water? Does a fig tree produce olives or a grapevine produce figs? No. And you can't draw fresh water from a salty spring. Two completely different things are not supposed to come from the same source. Fig trees are great. Grapevines are great. But a fig tree is not going to produce a grape and a grapevine is not going to produce a fig. And likewise, you put a freshwater fish in a salty pond and that fish is going to die. And if it's a freshwater spring and you go in to drink it, you probably aren't going to want to taste salt water. Friends, what, what, what can we learn when there's these two things that the, that the church could produce? And we have to ask ourselves the question, which one are we producing? Figs or grapes? Fresh water or salt water? Three things that I have seen the church produce. When we could have produced this, we accidentally, intentionally produced this. And how do we get back to the heart of producing the things that don't hurt people? So firstly... When you look at the, the through, through the lens of fresh water versus salt water... Church, are we, as a church, are we producing optics versus opportunity? Optics, how do things look, versus the opportunity of what we can do in the lives of individuals. 
There's a story in the New Testament in the book of Luke, and it's a story of a man named Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, as the song goes, when I was in Sunday school, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And it goes on from there. So there's a story of this little tiny dude, small guy, probably under five foot tall, and he couldn't see over the crowd. Everywhere Jesus went, there was a crowd of people. And Zacchaeus couldn't see, so he climbed up in a sycamore tree so he could see Jesus, and Jesus walks by. And Zacchaeus, we don't see that Zacchaeus made a noise, but Jesus looks up at Zacchaeus, and, and he says, Zacchaeus, what are you doing up there? And in essence, Zacchaeus is like, I, I just wanted to see you, Jesus. And Jesus says, Zacchaeus, come down. I want to be with you. And I want to read a passage of scripture in Luke chapter 19, verse 6 through 8. The story picks up right there in Luke chapter 19, verse 6. That he has quickly climbed down and he took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. He said, he has said, oh my goodness, Jesus wants to be with me. But the people were displeased. Who were the people? Oh, it hurts. The church people, the religious people. Because listen, read here. Verse 7, but the people were displeased. He has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner. They grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord. If I've cheated people on the taxes, I'll give them back four times as much. See, the church was so worried about the optics of Zacchaeus and Jesus. What is, what is Jesus doing being with sinner? And Jesus was about opportunity, not about optics. Jesus goes by and he sees this person up in the tree that just wants to see him. And he says, I want to be with you. I want to meet you where you are. But friends, the church is so often about the optics. How does this look if I post this, if I align with you, if I meet you there, if I go there, if you see me coming out of this place, if you see me befriending this person or posting this image, what does that look like for us? And Jesus is not about optics. The church is. The church can be. They hear the religious people, they cared more about what does it look like. And Jesus says, and I love the, the verse that the, the, the New Living Tra Translation says in verse 7, but the people were displeased. He has gone to be in the guest of sin, the, the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Verse 8 it starts with, Meanwhile, I just see in my head like this, you know, if we're watching a, a movie, here's the here's the uh, the church all disgruntled and angry, and then like this comes across the screen. Meanwhile, in other parts, Pan to Jesus, and Jesus doesn't give a rat's behind what they're saying because he's not going to stress the optics. He's going to let them think whatever they want because he's going to be meeting with a man named Zacchaeus, the chief of sinners, the Bible says. Right? So tax collectors, some of the worst sinners because they kept robbing people, people that are already poor. Tax collectors would say if you owed 10 bucks, they'd say you owed 40 bucks and there was nothing you could do about it. And so, Zacchaeus, so Jesus says, I don't care how this is going to look. I'm going to go meet with Zacchaeus. And while he was meeting with Zacchaeus, the church is ticked off. The church is groaning. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus' life is changing. And Zacchaeus says at the end of that passage, I will give half of my wealth to the poor, he says. And then he says, if I cheated people out of their taxes, I'm going to give them fourfold. We, church, might miss opportunity for incredible life change. Zacchaeus changed his city by giving half of his wealth to the poor. Zacchaeus went to some families that were broke because they had been robbed and he went and gave them back fourfold. All of that would have been missed if it would have been the church's way. Because the church wanted to be about the polished way, the way that looks safe, the way that just says to everyone else, no, nothing to see here. We're good. No sinners here. Friends, I hope that our church is full of people that know they are sinners. And instead of us looking somewhere else and saying, he is the chief of sinners, may we say, I am the chief of sinners. Because the one who recognizes himself as the chief of sinners is the one that Jesus wants to spend his time with. And I want Jesus to be with me. It's not optics. It'll never be optics. It'll always be opportunity because that's what Jesus said. Fresh water or spring water, choose one. Or fresh water, salt water, choose one. Optics, opportunity, choose one. You can't have both. We're going to choose opportunity. Secondly, optics versus opportunity or the easy way versus the honest way. And there's a story in the Old Testament, a guy by the name of Joshua. And Joshua had to go to battle on Joshua and God. This is an Old Testament story. 
And so Joshua went to God and he said, God, I, I got a lot of battles I got to win. And God promised Joshua, I'm going to let you win over and over and over again because you're going to go into these cities that are doing all kinds of horrible things. They're setting up all kinds of idols and they're doing all, all kinds of idolistic rituals that are dishonoring the name of God. And so God, God tells Joshua, if you honor me, I'm going to let you win every battle. And so God tells Joshua, when you go and take over these cities, burn up everything. Because all that crap is just, has, been, has been dedicated to false gods. So he says, you don't want that. I'm going to give you everything you need. So when you go into the city, burn all that junk up. And I'll give you victory time after time again. And so Joshua was supposed to go to a battle. He had fought way more difficult battles. So we only sent a fraction of his men to this battle. Because when his men came back, he said, oh, the men were like, oh, this is a piece of cake. We got this. Don't, don't stress this, Joshua. This will be a piece of cake. So Joshua sends in a... A lot of men, I think it was 3,000 men, still a lot of men, but a fraction of the men that he had available to him. And they go in there, and Joshua's men are slaughtered, slaughtered. And Joshua goes to God. He's like, God, I thought we had a deal. And God reveals to Joshua that there's someone in the camp that was being dishonest, that what God asked them to do in order to be blessed, he was no longer honoring that. And so in this, the story picks up from there. In Joshua chapter 7, we'll start in verse 19. Then Joshua said to Achan, my son, give, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, by just telling the truth. Make a confession and tell me what you have done. Don't hide it from me. And Achan replied in verse 20, It is true, I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. Among the plunder, I saw a beautiful robe from Babylon, 200 silver coins, and a bar of gold weighing more than a pound. I wanted them so much that I took them. They're hidden in the ground beneath my tent with the silver buried deeper than the rest. So Joshua sent some men to make a search, and they ran to the tent and found the stolen goods hidden there. Just as Achan had said, with the silver buried beneath the rest, they took the things from the tent and brought them to Joshua and all the Israelites, and they laid them on the ground before the presence of the Lord. Friends, the easy road versus the honest road. We, as a church, have done things the easy way. Even while I've been at Impact, we have hidden the truth at times because that was easier than telling what was actually going on during transitions, during challenging financial seasons. Friends, whenever the, whenever I said early on and our leadership staff continues to attest to the fact that we want to be about transparency, even when it sucks to have to say we're going to be about transparency because the honest way is always better than the easy way. And you... Friends, might have some things buried in your life. And I promise you, I promise you that while the grace of God is good, the blessings of God are being, are being snuffed out and choked out in your life because you won't unbury the things under your tent because it's too hard for you to talk about. It's too hard for you to be honest about. You did that in a moment of, 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 of like weakness and now it's there and you just bury it and you're not talking about it. And meanwhile, you wonder why there's the tension and the anxiety. Why is there the stress in your family and the stress in your camp? And God is saying to you today, because you bury the thing that you did and I want you to bring it to light so that we can begin to do a healing work and you can get back to receiving the full blessing that God wants to give you. We friends need to unbury some things that are buried deep in the recesses of our hearts and lives and begin to talk about them because I promise you based on the authority of scripture that God's promises and his blessings are contingent upon our ability to align to his will so that he can bless us. And that's true for us as a church. But friends, if you are going to be the church just as much as 8299 East Stockton is the church, you need to unbury, perhaps, perhaps, as I have had to so many times, perhaps you need to unbury some things because you took the easy road. And like Aiken, you just couldn't resist. You took that thing. You, you cheated on your taxes. You, you, you had that one night stand. It, it didn't get physical, but you know that it, got, it went, went way too far. You're struggling with this addiction, alcoholism, pain pills, or I, I don't know. You you insert it here because I promise you the Holy Spirit is perking something up in your heart. And I don't got to say it. You know what it is. Can we unbury that together? Can we stop taking the easy way and begin to take the honest way together? Spring water, salt water. We got to choose. Easy way or honest way. We got to choose. And lastly... We're going to choose prejudice or we're we going to choose people. In, in, in James chapter 2, the same kind of passage that our whole, our whole stories, our whole, our, our whole tongue, what we're saying, 
What are we, how are we communicating? What are our lives dictating? We read from James chapter three and just the chapter earlier in James chapter four. And James has given, gives such practical insight for our, our walk with Jesus. And we're gonna actually do a study on the book of James as I've read this this past week. I'm excited, it'll be later in the year, but such practical insight for you and I. In James chapter two, verse one through four, James says this, James, the half brother of Jesus, now talking to, to, to Christians who had kind of been uh, dispersed among the region. James writes and says, My dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you have favor some over others? I don't know about your Bible, but right above the heading of this chapter, it actually says, The warning against prejudice. Verse 2, for example, suppose someone comes into your meeting dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry, and another comes in who is poor and dressed in dirty clothes. If you give special attention and a good seat to the rich person, but you say to the poor person, you can stand over there or you can sit on the floor. Well, verse 4, doesn't this discrimination show that your judgments are guided by evil motives? Oh, it might not be rich or poor. It, it might be black and white, Asian. It might be based upon who you're kissing or who you're sleeping with or them or they. The Bible says clearly when we start telling people, prioritizing people based upon a prejudice that we have for them, we are guided by evil motives in church. May it not be so. May our prejudice never be, not only should it not be important, may it never even affect how we involve ourselves with meeting people. We have to choose. Are we going to be passionate about removing prejudice so that we can be passionate about reaching people? We only have two great commands. Love God and love people. And you want to know the quickest way to not do the second? It's to not do, not do the deep work with the fact that you and I might have some prejudice towards people that are different with us, and it won't be so at impact. It, may it never be so at our church, regardless what you're doing, regardless what color your skin are, how much money you make, if you live in a house or if you sleep in your car, if you're the top giver at our church and you, you, you allow us to do so much ministry or you never have given a dime and you never choose to give a dime, regardless if you're married to another man or another woman or you've been divorced 14 times, may that, may that prejudice never, ever, ever get in the way of us showing someone the person of Jesus. Never prejudice. Always people. Salt water and spring water can't coexist. And prejudice and a heart for people and reaching people can never, ever, ever, ever coexist. And we've got to do the deep work that understands the difference. The tongue is a weapon of mass destruction. What we say, how we communicate, whether we're honest or whether we're not. Whether, we're, whether we say you're not worth it or you're a sinner and I'm holy. So I'm not going to reach you. Optics versus the opportunity. How, what we say about people and circumstances and what we believe to be about people. What we say about how we stand on issues that directly affect people. What we communicate. Our tongue. Our, 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 our value statements about what we believe and what we think about people. What we say on social media. Our tongue, illustrated by what we communicate, can be a weapon of mass destruction. And actually, James, back to our original scripture that we read or first thing when we talked about this, the reality of these bombs that drop down. And there's a greater weapon that can do even more damage than those bombs that I watched on a, a movie called 12 Strong. Just coordinates are given and bombs drop and it destroys cities and villages. There's a weapon more brutal than that and it's the tongue. And in James chapter 3, two verses and we're done. In verse 5 of James chapter 3, it says, In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. A tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. We know a lot about forest fires here in Northern California, right? And verse 6, And among all the parts of the body, all the parts of the body, so then James is saying, you do, you take inventory of every single part of the body. The heart 
Whatever, whatever the most, what seemingly the most important part of the body is, James chapter 3 verse 6 says, among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. Get this. It is a whole world of wickedness. The tongue is an entire world of wickedness, corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire. For it is set on fire by hell itself. We know a lot about fires here in Northern California. Coming from Ohio, I had never seen a forest fire. To be honest with you, it doesn't make, a lot of times it doesn't make national news. It's obviously very, it's constantly in the forefront of our news, but sometimes a, a, a fire does make national news, right? So I think about the camp, campfire of 2018, started by a spark on a transformer from something that PG&E was controlling. Friends, can I just suggest, and I, 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 I'm not trying to be dramatic, I'm not trying to be preachy at you, I'm not trying to, be, to come, to, get, to, to just like condemn you, but there are some forest fires that you and I have set ablaze that's doing more damage than even, or not, believe it or not, even the campfire of 2018 did by that spark on that PG, PG&E transformer. You have said some things. I have said some things on a post, on a comment, on a text. I have said some things about somebody that you and I both know got back to somebody else. And they live with that day in and day out. There is some fires raging in our church because of dysfunction between people that have said things, posted things, done things, met in groups without other people to talk about them. That is cross-contamination that is ruining the ability for us to produce something pure to those that are coming to our church. Can you please, friends, can you please help me put out these forest fires, these raging forest fires that are going on because of things you and I have said, maybe, maybe, maybe. I, I was riding my motorcycle down Grantline just yesterday on the way to see our friend Mike Vandenus, and, and the, the, uh, the fire department was still there on site putting out uh, like a field fire. All those fire trucks and all those incredible firemen that are right there, that are there to put it out before it got to the houses that were behind it. Can I beg you? Can I beg you? Whether you started or not, whether you were the spark that started, can I beg? Can, can, I, can there be some firemen and some firewomen that are raised up in our church to begin to do the kind of work that heals the lives of people who are burning because of what we, was said and done because of the church, because of maybe someone in this church? Can I urge you, friends, to suit up and to go put out some fires that maybe you started, maybe you did, but you know they're there, and it might start off, can we grab a coffee? Can I take you out? I know you're hurting, and I just want to be a Part of putting this fire out in your life. The tongue is either going to set fires or maybe, maybe, maybe God could use our tongues to put out some fires that have been raging for far too long. Can we put out some fires, friends? There's a song. I, to be honest, I haven't even found it yet. I'm going to try to find it. I'm going to find a way to post it. But at our live services, I asked Becky and the team to sing the song Hosanna. And, tr and really, it's because of a line in the bridge that simply says, Break my heart for what breaks yours. Oh, that's the desire of my heart, God, that you would break my heart. Break the, per the heart of the person listening for what breaks your heart. And I promise you that what breaks the heart of God is, is when we choose how things look of reaching people right where they are. When we choose to, to lie or bury something because saying, be, it's telling the truth is too easy. It breaks the heart of God. Be honest. Let's bury that crap. Or let's unbury that crap. Let's dig up that crap. Or lastly, because of the things we've said about people, we didn't like their lifestyle. We didn't like what they were doing. We didn't like how they handled something. We think they're a bad husband or a bad wife or they don't parent well or their kids are out of control. That breaks the heart of God because the person you're talking about about is a son or daughter that God sent his son Jesus who brutally went to the cross so that they could be known by him and you and I are setting fire ablaze to the lives of the one that Jesus came to restore. That Jesus came to remind them how much worth that they have and you and I can't shut up long enough to stop telling them what they do wrong. Let's put out some fires and be a church that is about no longer contaminating that what we want to do because we can't stop pouring salt water into the pure water that we're trying to serve at the tables of the people that are coming to our church. Let me pray. And that you just, let's you and I go be some firefighters, some spiritual, relational firefighters to put out some fires that have been set ablaze in our church. Let's pray. God, thank you for your, your word. Man, it's, it's, 
It's a heavy word. It's a, it's, it's a revealing word. And God, I pray that your Holy Spirit, who, who isn't there to condemn, there is therefore now, Romans, I think it's Romans 8, says there is therefore now no condemnation to those who belong to Christ Jesus. You're, we're not here to condemn. The Holy Spirit's not going to condemn, but the Holy Spirit might do a work of conviction to reveal things that need to be made right. And I pray in Jesus' name that you would do some revealing. I'm, I'm cool. Have, Father, I'm cool with the person listening who hates my guts because of how hard this was to hear. Do your work, the good work, the complete work. That's more important than me being liked. And it's the work that says, friend, son, daughter. We, we, we have some fires to put out because we set some lives ablaze, some gossip or some hatred or some anger. So, Father, I pray we'd be a church that would be about, about choosing fresh water. How can fresh water and salt water come out of the same source? They can't. And if they do, no one wants to drink from that. It's going to make people sick. And so, Father, I ask you in Jesus' name that you would let us be a place that chooses to be fresh water, chooses to be spring water, does the work that stops the saltiness from coming out of the streams and the rivers that we are running out of. Oh, God, we're so grateful for your presence. We're so grateful for your plan. And we want to be and walk where you've already been. Take this church, take our church, wherever you want us to go. The answer is yes, and the answer is we will go. We love you, Lord. We're thankful for the work you're doing in our church. Continue to use us to be a church that is humbly postured in a way that you can use to bring hope and life and the love of Jesus to the city. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. I love you. I'm so thankful to be your pastor. Let's be a church that the city can come to to see Jesus. It's going to be some hard choices. It's going to be some constant decisions. But let's do it together. Have a great week.